But another issue that's on your minds, and we mentioned it this morning, is passport delays, especially for people applying for the first time for your babies, for your children, and you're eager. Uh, some of you are eager to travel again, and some of you just want to get the passport sorted, and uh, you're not having a good experience with the passport office. Let's talk to travel expert Owen Corey now, and journalist. Good morning, Owen. How are you? Good morning, Emer. I wish I could bring you good news on this, but I don't think I can. Oh, we love good news. But, um, you know, when I heard Simon Coveney um, back some months ago saying this would all be sorted within weeks, he said. He was pretty adamant. I've heard the clip played many times saying, I think back in April, look, this is not going to take long to sort out that when they run at Optimum, they get through 100,000 applications a week. What's going on, Owen? There's a big logjam which isn't really uh, confined to the passport service, sadly. Uh, even births aren't being registered. Um, we do have a problem with, um, you know, the scale of work, the way, the pace that things used to go through on registrations and passport applications having been slowed down by office dispersal and the new office arrangements. Now, I can see um, you could hear Simon Coveney's frustration almost that this isn't being delivered at the pace that he wanted. And the officials were quite um you know they weren't optimistic but they said it could happen but they probably needed a few things to run very well for them in terms of work and productivity and everything for it to happen and they have a huge backlog anyway to deal with now the the numbers of passports being processed even in the pandemic are huge but there is the backlog uh, is qu going to take a lot of management and i don't think that they foresaw the, the, how long it would be to get through it. As I say, um, the, the passport office is also dealing with the fact that registrations of new births uh, are, it is, uh, and that's a completely separate issue from this. It is sort of having an impact, but that's another one that nobody foresaw, and I'm not really sure what is at the foot of that. Right. Now, I believe some civil servants may have had a word in Pat Dawson's ear and said... Uh, uh, look that you could redeploy us there's many of us out there that aren't very busy at the moment have you heard anything about that and how um they could actually manage the backlog if they got more people involved no doubt you can bring uh, people in from other areas the pattern uh and it relates to international travel in general is that people have been deployed out of anything that would, um, you know, Im impact would would have be related to international travel into other areas are furloughed even. So that certainly has been the pattern all the way through. I would hesitate to say that uh, it was a deliberate, you know, policy to marginalise uh, things like the. Uh, applications for passports, applications for the EHIC card, which is used abroad. But certainly they were not prioritised and we would uh, probably have, you know, if this was a normal year, if there was no COVID restrictions and we ran into a little bit of a backlog like this, it would take um, a bit of time to clear, never mind the extra COVID restrictions that uh, come with um, the management of offices and with remote working. Has there been a very good uptake in business, Owen? Um, and what routes are the busiest at the moment since the restrictions for international travel eased? Um, there has been an uptake, to call it very good, uh, would not be true. We are way behind the rest of Europe in the terms of the uptake. Um, it's about 74% of the capacity that we had in 2019 is back in the air across Europe. Uh, it's around 44% in Ireland. We've no longer the most disconnected country of the 40 in the European Air Traffic Control. We are the third uh, most disconnected compared to 2019. But remember, we're the first, the most disconnected island being an island makes things a little bit more dramatic for us so we have uh, seen things begin to move and uh, Dublin airport back to capacity of about just over 60 percent of where it was 2019 Shannon and Cork agree uh, bleeding a lot um, but what we will probably see is that uh, calming down uh, come September October um, we don't, uh, you know, we we do we do the 
peak season, the peak period for people moving across Europe was the, the peak day was July the thirteenth. Uh, July the thirtieth, we had about twenty six thousand flights moving across Europe that day. Uh, Ireland was back to uh, uh, w- ahead of where we were, but it was only up to about forty four percent of where we were before. So we've had nothing like uh, a normal or an approaching uh, normality summer that uh, in the way that other major European countries like Germany have been. Germany did most to keep connected through this entire pandemic. Okay. Um, Are there consequences for a slow uptake in international travel in the medium term? What are those consequences or even the long term? The major consequence of the one I've been talking about is uh, the routes that we might lose. We had uh, about 200 direct flights, direct routes from Dublin. Um, We have 130 of them back, which is quite good. Uh, We have lost a couple of airlines, but not any of the major ones. Um, when that where that uh, changes um, will be when uh, other countries get up and running, you know, at a higher capacity than we were. Airlines will look to those places to place their aircraft, but. Imer, it hasn't happened yet in Ireland. You know, you can, you can get. Um, I mean, obviously there will be vested interests from the aviation industry. Uh, Ryanair talking about dithering politicians and useless Neffet, and it'll all. He'll take all his aircraft elsewhere. He's not going to. He just announced five new routes for winter uh, yesterday uh, from Ryanair. They were nobody's going to move from Dublin when they think there's market share to be gained there. And it's very interesting that airlines have lost money, but. You know, we've seen we're seeing signs. Uh, the Aer Lingus Washington route. Uh, Irish people can't get into America with an Irish passport, or an Irish citizen uh, cannot get into America at the moment. But uh, Aer Lingus still opened their Washington route on August the thirteenth. They're looking at San Francisco coming back. Uh, Air Canada, Toronto is back. So a lot of the routes are back, not filling, not making money, but they're there, waiting to see what happens next. The real problem, Emer, is that if nothing happens next, or if the, the you know the spiral of uh, you know hesitancy about international travel continues in Ireland, and our competitor destinations, like a big competitor for Ireland for inbound tourism, particularly from North America, would be Scotland. If places like that move and we don't, then we could be in a position where we're behind the game trying to chase it back. I don't need to explain that to 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 people how when you fall uh, seven points behind immediately after half time, it takes a lot of chasing. So that's where we could be. Um, but w- oddly enough, you know, we did the last winter, grim as it was for connectivity, the most disconnected country in Europe, because everyone else was going through something similar. We didn't inflict enormous damage on ourselves. What happens next is where the damage could be done. Right. Where are most Irish people who are travelling? Where are they going, Owen? The traditional routes. Nobody's trying anything new because we're all rediscovering uh, flying. We're all, it's all like the first flight again. So the trunk routes, the two trunk routes out of Dublin are Malaga and Faro. Um, the Canary Islands, it, not t- enormous during summer. They will be the big winter uh, destination. But it's back to Spain and Portugal. Greece is getting a good airing as well. Italy is a lower COVID uh, rate than the Spain and Portugal, where it's rising. Uh, that's been getting a good airing. And you can see um, that people were very hesitant in the immediate aftermath of the July the 19th uh, reopening. We had, uh, you know, a real sort of sense of trepidation going through the airport. But people are getting used to it. Airline staff are quite used to it because the rest of Europe opened up on July the 1st. The first experience, bit of an adventure for people. But after that, uh, you're, you know, it's, it, it works very, very well. You can uh, access your COVID certificate uh, documentation at the gate by just pressing a link on your mobile boarding pass. Uh, Ryanair are doing things like giving, going, going, pre-checking everyone for their COVID documentation so the boarding process isn't slowed down at all. That was a bit of a surprise. Another thing to watch, the really important thing to watch is the locator forms. They're more important uh, in some ways than the COVID documentation because it seeks your COVID documentation and generates its own QR code in the, in the case of some countries. Uh, there's a few bureaucratic uh, night 
nightmares stuck in those locator forms in Spain. They look for the municipality when you're uh, filling your locality, your your locator form. Not everyone knows where that is. It won't allow you to go to the next page. Uh, I've been a lot of lobbying to get that changed. But watch that locator form. And another thing to watch is the baggage policy, because our two major airli- Irish airlines have contradictory baggage policies. Aer Lingus um, is against people bringing uh, cabin baggage. They've incentivized you to put it in the hold. Aer Lingus' oh, philosophy is to get people on and off the aircraft in groups uh, r- rather as quickly as possible rather than people standing in the aisle pulling down bags. Ryanair are incentivizing people to bring the bag on board. Ryanair's philosophy is the fewer people handle a bag in the current climate, uh, it's, it's the better. So we've That's contra- funny, so completely contradictory, contradictory uh, baggage policies have an eye out for that, Emer. Okay, very, very interesting. Oh, and finally, back to the passports, just with your insider information and knowledge, is there any advice you could give frustrated listeners who are trying to deal with the passport office or is there any you know that you could share with us? Not really. Um, the quickest way to get noticed is direct tweet. I do know that um, the passport office, um, you know, they, they traditionally had a very good emergency service, which responded very quickly. But those, I think part of the problem is that has broken down or has been waylaid by COVID. Um, there isn't, uh, you know, that they, they, Actual passport personnel, staff are tremendously helpful. Uh, getting access to them is the huge problem. As I said at the beginning, I wish there was a, a good news I could bring uh, to this, but it does look like it's something that's going to have to work its way through the system and uh, it doesn't look like doing so quickly at the moment. Okay. Owen, Corey, thank you very much. Emer, as always, always a pleasure. Thank you. Expertise or thanks to Owen, isn't he great for giving us all the lowdown? And if-